We're going to look at the game from the Reykjavik Open. I think it's a very instructive game, especially the end game, and some decisions in the end game leading to the final end game, which is very nice. Now, this was played uh, between Adrian Soderstrom with white, Swedish Fiedemaster, and an Indian double, uh, WCM, Sachi Jain. Now, white played at d4. We have d5. Let's go quickly over the opening, e6, g3. We have the Catalan, bishop d2, bishop e7, c4, mainline stuff here, takes, castles, castles, and queen 2c2, all well known. Now a6 is sort of the old move, b5 has been played a lot. Recently, for instance, Carlsen uh, against Nepomuzi, but a6 is a, it's a very solid option. Now I can play queen takes c4, a4 also has been reasonably popular as well. But so this round, you took on c4 with the queen, b5, the queen goes back, bishop b7, and now bishop g5. And there, there are three main moves. Uh, I'll play the Catalan, I'll play them all. My favorite used to be bishop d2. That became very theoretical. Bishop f4 is sort of an old move I do time to time, and uh, bishop g5 is perhaps the oldest move which I don't play as often, but this would be five. I don't know, maybe Soderstrom is uh, under some influence from Ulf Anderson, who was a great endgame player and yeah, played some Catalan. I think I remember seeing some games where he plays bishop g5. And bishop g5 often has the idea to discourage black from playing c5 because you can flick in at some point bishop takes f6 and, and black needs to take with one of these pieces, otherwise he gets double pawns. And once he takes with one of these pieces, he loses control of c5. So knight b to d2. This knight comes to b2 rather than c3 because we want to keep pressure on the c5 square. The knight often comes to b3. And the whole idea basically in this line for black, can he play c5 and get away with it? If he can, usually he's very close to equalizing, if not equal already. And c5 was played here. And it looks like this move actually works here. And white token f6. Bishop takes f6, pawn takes e5. So we won the pawn, but black immediately attacks it, rook to c8. And now white would like to protect it here, but the bishop is pinning the pawn. So we need another way. So we went to knight to b3 to protect the pawn, but bishop d5, and this hint set may be taken here and then taken on c5 when black should be fine. Therefore, knight f to d2, intending to take back with the knight. We have a trade of bishops, bishop takes d2, king takes d2, and bishop back to e7, attacking the pawn. White can try to hold on for it, like for one move with c6, but after knight e5, the pawn is probably not going to drop anyway. So white plays knight e4 here, knight takes e5, and bishop takes e5. And the point here, of course, is that knight takes e5 is met with Queen to d5 check when he went back the material and yeah, he won the pawn back. So what white is playing for here after all these trades? He likes his knight. And I very much myself like the knight on d3 in these structures. I think that's where the knight went in this game. Rook 8 c1, bishop b6. And we had the rook trade and rook c1. Queen d7 and another rook trade. So White is playing for the queen and knight combo. Very often it's said that the queen and the knight combo is stronger than the queen and the bishop combo. And this is something that strong players try to do quite often against lower rated players. To try to get some ads when, when, you know, when they're trying to squeeze out a win, just like White is doing here. Now h4, usual move, just trying to get some space. You know, nice pawns, there aren't dark squares, so uh, we're taking away a square from the dark squared bishop, h6. E3, putting all the, all the pawns on, on dark squares. Again, playing against the bishop. Bishop to d8, knight d2. Trying to reroute the knight. The bishop f6, b3. Queen d8, knight to f3. Queen a5, tickling these pawns, but white just protects them. Queen c2, queen c3, and we have a trade. Now, most likely this end game should be drawn, I, I think, Black should be fine here, but still, you know, we can we can play for something. King of six, sorry, king of eight, 
Uh, king e2, bringing the king, it's an endgame. Logical chess here by both players. Knight d2, king to d7. And here, white starts to break up this, this uh, nice pawn chain, which is restricting the bishop, but also at some stage we need to get some space, so he plays h5, e5, and generally I'd advise black against putting too many pawns on the same uh, color as the bishop. So I think these pawns are very well placed, as is, to uh, control squares in cooperation with the bishop. But e5 is played, and this, okay. We can some squares, king e6, doesn't want to give away this square or this square. Knight f3, bishop d8, g4. Stopping black from going f5, otherwise black might have become better there, grabbing some space. Bishop f6, knight e1, and yeah, here finally black think, uh, makes what I think is a, is a small mistake. I mentioned the pawns are fine here. Keep them as much as you can on the light squares. The famous endgame before Capablanca, where Capablanca had a bishop, his opponent had a very good knight, and there was uh, an isolated pawn. And what Capablanca did, he put all his pawns on different colors than his bishop. So the bishop can move around, it's not gonna, not gonna get stuck. And black breaks that here by playing, playing a5. And this allows white in many cases to play a4 and just create a target here on, on a5. Knight d3 was played first. King d6 doesn't want to allow knight here. And here f3. White had a very interesting idea here that, oh, it's tricky to see, it's king f5. And the idea is to play g5. Don't remember seeing this idea too often. Now if you take with a pawn, I play h6. And black is in trouble because this bishop is undermined, the pawn is going to run, and you lose a piece if you take. Still you have to calculate stuff, uh, because the black king will start running after you win the piece. But still this looks very good for white. Also bishop takes g5, knight takes e5. When this hangs, and this is also looking quite good for white. The king of hell is interesting, probably gives white an advantage here. But instead he played f3 and the struggle continues. It's an endgame where white probably has better chances, but it's very difficult to win. g6 nova black, taken away the square, so not a bad idea. hg, fg, f4. Still not a lot of pieces. And here, king g5 was played. King d3. Doesn't want to allow the uh, king to become active. But here, I think black could have more or less forced the draw. He played g5. Which, you know, first of all, we can some light squares. And you have the pawns on the same color as the bishop. We stick to the bishop, and potentially h6 could become a target. Black should have done is just play h5 and try to liquidate some pawns. Something like this. Put the bishop here. And then we're going to be able to run here. And there's not much white can do about it. Let's say king here, king here. Okay, let's, let's stop by bringing the knight, but we play here. We have to protect the pawn. And this is very forcing. We play a4. I'm trying to take, so you have to take here. I'll take with the king. Let's say I start running, but now the king just uh, comes back. You can play something like this, and then e5, but I just push the pawn b4, you push, I go here, and you just too late. You can't play king g2 because I take the last pawn, and here I take the pawn and play b3, and it's a draw. So this is probably what black should have done after g5. Black still needs to defend very accurately. g5, knight to uh, e2, king b4, knight d4. Again, black needs to be careful. He plays king a3, he took on b5. King uh, takes a2, and knight back to d4. And of course, we can't take because this pawn would run really fast. So king a3, good move. King c4, preparing to move the knight. And now black strikes with h5, which probably is not working. I'm not sure how white will continue if you just wait with king b2. 
uh, to H5 things uh, get a more force signature. And let's see what happens. G4, now we have a race. Knight F5, Bishop E5. Trying to support this, but okay, we keep pushing. H6, Bishop back to H8, H7. This point is becoming really dangerous. But also, White needs the king. The king is protecting the pawn. To push this pawn, you also need the king. Because the knight is stuck defending against this pawn. So at some stage, White needs to give up the pawn. He plays e4, and now king g5. So black gets the b3 pawn and counterplay e5. We have a raise. Knight d4 check, strong move, followed by knight e2. Now the race starts, a4, e6, and both sides get a queen. Queen, queen. But when this happens, it's very important to have the move. Okay, for now this is protected, but white has queen to b8 check. And there's no square for the king on the c-file, so the king must go to the a-file. And now, check, and the queen trade is forced. The queens that uh, just got onto the board, they disappear immediately, and knight takes g3. And at first, I thought this endgame was drawn. But it's not. It's winning for white. And the idea is to get the king here and get the knight to g7. If the bishop is somewhere here on the diagonal, then the knight of g7 is blocking the bishop. So the bishop could be here. But then we put the knight of g7 also and play king g8 under the right circumstances. And that's when the, uh, the black king is far away. So king here, knight f5. The idea is to put the knight on d4, so we have to get the bishop inside the diagonal out of these squares, so bishop h8. Bishop can't be blocked from stopping the pawn. Okay, king e6, you have to play this, otherwise king d7. King d8, king f7. Black into nothing but weight, so king d7, but now knight h4. Hits the bishop. The bishop must move. It goes to c3. Now knight f4. The threat is here and here. So the bishop must go back to h8. Knight six anyway. King d7, knight c5. And the king has to stay close. It's very important for, for the black king to stay close. If white now plays knight here, that's too soon. After this and this, we go here. And if the king takes, we have to select the correct square. And we have to select the square such that the knight cannot kick us away from this square and this square. So what you do is you put the king on the same color square as the knight. Because on the next move, the knight goes to a light square. You can check this one, but it can't protect this one. So after something like this, all the white knight can do is give checks, but it can't give us a super strong. We need to move something, but this is stuck. So we will be able to move back and forth here and secure the draw. So there's no way to win a tempo with a knight. It's always going back and forth between a black square and a light square. So nothing to be done. So this is the defensive idea. But the way black is playing this and the way to win this is to avoid this. So knight c5, king d8, and now king f8. And now we got this square. And we got these squares. So the king must retreat. If the bishop moves, there's check and knight here and we block the bishop from protecting h8. King c8, but now the king is too far away. And now we play king g8 with a tempo, and we bring the knight. Knight g7 next, and the king is too far away to execute the drawing idea of staying on these squares. Very nice and instructive endgame. So I hope this added to, added to your endgame knowledge. I needed to fix mine. I didn't know the evaluation of this endgame, but now I know, I also know the defensive idea. But we need to know both. Important knowledge, let's increase it together and grow as chess players. See you next time.